we will start on time, which is uh, extraordinary here in Portugal. So a <laughs> good thing. Just more seconds, a few more seconds, just to admit the ones uh, in the waiting room. Hello, Gillian, how are you? Hi. You're muted. Hello, all. Hello, all. Mm -hmm. I'm busy yeah. trying to figure out how to um, do a Zoom presentation. How are you, Peter? Very you well, good. thank you. You look well. Thank nice you. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's nice to work with you again for, for a better world. <laughs> and Ms. Francois, fun, wonderful to see you. Yeah, it's wonderful to see you, Peter, as well. Mm -hmm. So I think we are ready to start. Karina, how long do you want me to speak? Uh, how long you wish to speak? Oh, really? <laughs> you shouldn't say that to Peter. It's dangerous, Karina. <laughs> yeah, I know that. <laughs> yeah, I like to hear that. My, whenever I ask this to my daughter or my, my wife, so they say, just make it snappy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, will, I will kick off the event, so I can ask you to please mute uh, yourself if possible, just because of you know sounds from from the background. Uh, and I think okay, so here all welcome to the first Clean Bees Conference, a joint initiative from Transparency International chapters in Iceland, Norway, and Portugal. We believe that power up anti-bribery within the business sector is almost needed uh, to protect human rights and to achieve the sustainable development goals. Corruption not only undermines economic progress and financial sustainability, it kills lives by preventing the most vulnerable people, especially women and children in accessing basic yet essential services such as health, education and social care. And corruption also represents a major obstacle to the progress of countries and to the social mobility of the future generations. We at the Global North can't remain indifferent to the impact of our actions on the reproduction of poverty in which millions of people all over the world live in. Instead, we ought to commit to universal solidarity. And for that, we believe that is fundamental step is to expand the UNCAC, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, the OCD Anti-Bribery Convention, and SDG 16 compliance into corporate governance and corporate social responsibility. We trust that all of you here today and the ones listening through social media are willing to commit to increase business integrity and the business sector participation in defending human rights and SDGs. So thank you very much for joining us in this transformative agenda today. I also thank our guest speakers for, for their support and the colleagues from TI Iceland and TI Norway uh, that are uh, undertaking this project together with us. Um, and also a special thank to DEA Grants that is supporting the initiative. So uh, my first words will be uh, from Ms. Maria João Lois. Deputy Coordinator of the National Focal Point in Portugal of the European Economic Area Financial Mechanism. Please, Maria João, you can address to the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Uh, it is a great pleasure as National Focal Point for the grants in Portugal to join this uh, online international conference with such relevant keynote speakers. Um, I want to congratulate Transparency International and the persons of Karina Carvalho, João Oliveira and Martina Garis for overcoming the current challenge that we all faced in the pandemic and uh, put forward this initiative that was approved for a long time ago, but uh, you managed to adapt. And uh, it's, it's very good to see that the initiative is going well and uh, delivering results. So we are very pleased with that. Companies can play the most relevant role to fight corruption practices by promoting truly engaged corporate social responsibility and are a key stakeholder to effect change. We at the EU Grants Portugal are very pleased to have approved funding to support bilateral working relations between the chapters of Transparent International in Portugal, Norway, and Iceland to uh, develop this important initiative. 
as binding principles, all programs and activities funded by the grants shall be based on common values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and the respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities, and shall, shall follow the principles of good governance, be participatory and inclusive, accountable, transparent, responsive, effective, and efficient. As a rule, there is zero tolerance towards corruption in the A grants implementation. For those who are not yet familiar with the A grants, it is a seven-year financial mechanism that results from the agreement on the European Economic Area signed in the city of Porto in May 1992 under the Portuguese presidency of the European Union at the time between the member states of the European Union and three EFTA states, Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein, granting their participation in the EU internal market. The party to these agreements created this financial mechanism known by EA grants with the objectives of reducing economic and social disparities and strengthening bilateral relations. The current period of the EA grants in Portugal supports five programs in five different areas. The blue growth on the blue economy, the environment program, the culture program, work-life balance and civil society with a fund with active citizens fund, a fund that is operated independently uh, by a consortium that is selected by the donors. Uh, and this is very important uh, for the grants to um, ensure throughout the 15 beneficiary countries, this independency of the NGOs. And also we have this special fund for bilateral relations, the, the one that uh, supported this initiative and it's operated directly by us. The strengthening of bilateral relations between donor and beneficiary countries is a hallmark of the grants, as you can understand already. And an objective that, in addition to economic and social cohesion, is of equal importance. To support this purpose, the Fund for Bilateral Relations, with about 3 million euros, have already selected over 50 bilateral initiatives in so many different areas, from education to innovative research, from public policies to performing arts, including the Clean Bees Bilateral Initiative, and supporting the cooperation between entities, which is a very um, sound value that we all want to share. Recently, it was agreed with the donor countries reinforcement of this fund for the reallocation of the reserve, which shows the importance of bilateral relations for the grants. On July the 1st, a new call uh, was opened, a different one that uh, the Transparency International applied for, for this initiative, and it aims to finance uh, bilateral initiatives between Portugal and Norway in any area, but with a proven innovation component. At the current stage of implementation of the grants in Portugal, all open calls have been launched in the remaining programs with a total amount of support of 80 million euros. We, you can still find a few open calls ongoing, some programs such as the Blue Growth, training on job for startups, for instance, and in environment uh, in uh, climate adaptation, as well as open calls for support of bilateral initiatives under the different programs. Please check our joint website where you can find all the programs and information on the implementation of this financial mechanism and funding opportunities that are still available. And follow us on the social media, we are also very active there. In May 2021, under the Portuguese presidency again, it was agreed with the European Union the terms, within the European Union, the terms to initiate negotiations with the donors uh, of the three, the three donor countries for the next funding period of the grants. And we, we hope that these two negotiations are swift so we can continue to have this important support to Portugal. I'm very looking forward for the discussions on, the, on this conference and, uh, and the results from the Clean Bees. And uh, congratulations on this initiative. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you so much for your support. Uh, and also for, for your, all your understanding during, during the last period and, and all the help from, from the grants team in, in, in putting us everything together, what we need to, to move forward. Thank you so much. I will pass to uh, my colleague, Gross Karen Fistro, right now uh, for the introduction of our first guest speaker, Dr. Peter Eigen. Thank you so much. Gro, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, my name is Gros Gorenfistro from uh, Transparency International Norway, and it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Peter Eigen. 
He is the founder of Transparency International, and he's been an inspiration for the establishment of national transparency chapters in more than 100 countries. He served as the chair from 1993 to 2005, and until 2019, chair of the Advisory Council. From 2006 to 2011, Eigen was the founding chair of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which as its secretariat in Oslo. Peter has long experience in academia and international development. He worked with the World Bank uh, for 25 years. He taught at the universities of Frankfurt, Georgetown, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, and from uh, 2002 to 2011 at the Freie Universität in Berlin. In August 2014, he co-founded the Humboldt Viadrina governance platform in Berlin, and he founded in 2015 and shared its fisheries transparency initiative and co-chairs now its climate transparency initiative. Peter also serves on the boards of CARE, Stiftung Kinderhilfe, Child Aid and German Doctors. Peter, was recently described by the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung as a grand seigneur in the fight against corruption. And yeah. it is therefore uh, a pleasure to have you here. And many thanks, Peter, for joining us to share your experiences and uh, observations. So you have the floor now, Peter. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Gro, for being such a generous introducer. I, I, I hope to I get you more to introduce in other, in other events also. Um, I have to thank you and uh, Karina and of course Tor for this um, uh, invitation. And uh, this is a very important um, subject. Uh, Maria Jaulaus, uh, I want to congratulate you for having supported that because this um, uh, cooperation between the main actors of society, that is on the one hand government, on the other hand, civil society, and then as a third partner, um, uh, also the business community. This is a major, major, um, uh, issue and, um, and a major recommendation for creating a better world. And therefore, I'm very pleased and, and really feel honored to be allowed to address you on this. Uh, of course, I will mainly speak from my experience um, with Transparency International and EITI and FITI and a new thing which I'm trying to create right now, which is access to rural electricity, which again is based on this concept of um, uh, of multi-stakeholder uh, cooperation, so I um, uh, thank you for um, for letting me talk uh, about this a little bit, and I will not um, talk too long. Um, uh, don't, don't have any any fear, uh, uh, dear Gro. Um, we already did a study uh, on exactly that issue um, uh, about um, eight years ago um, that was still um, under the auspices of the Humboldt Viadrina Governance School, where we received a, a grant from Siemens of all companies uh, in order to study basically um, the best practice on uh, anti-corruption incentives and sanctions for business. At that time, um, we, uh, we organized a survey and we got responses of, uh, of 200, uh, over 220 uh, people and we wrote a report uh, exactly on this subject, which is still sitting on our shelves and I can distribute uh, copies to, to those of you who are interested, because this goes into great detail on uh, how effective the incentives are what the best incentives are, uh, what the uh, whether they should be sanctions or whether they should be rewards, uh, how the different stakeholders uh, have to interact in order to implement these things, and um, and then what these different uh, incentives and sanctions um, uh, can um, uh, cause uh, in their in their application. So um, I'm very pleased that you are asking me. Uh, to talk a bit uh, about my, my, my sense uh, about exactly this, these issues. Um, I feel it's absolutely necessary, and I think the success of Transparency International totally depended 
on this interaction of these three actors. I mean, in, in many civil society organizations um, in, in the world, they are very reluctant to work closely either with government. So in the United States, uh, it's considered to be very risky to take money or support from governments because uh, you lose your credibility, they feel. Um, in, in Europe, um, the, the NGOs very often are, are scared to accept money and support from, from businesses. Now, we at Transparency International, we accepted money and support support from everybody because we knew we needed this. And um, this was not as outspoken in the beginning, but we tried to put in place uh, safeguards against losing our um, independence, uh, our credibility, um, and uh, including um, uh, an advisory council with very prominent people who uh, would more with their name more or less guarantee that we, uh, that we remain independent, even if we work closely with these other stakeholders in society. And so I think um, the um, Transparency International was, was able to basically uh, become a major actor in fighting corruption and um, uh, working for better governance all over the world. In fact, uh, the world had too long relied mainly on um, the governments of sovereign nations in order to be, take care of uh, uh, of governance uh, worldwide, and uh, it has become quite clear over the years that this uh, is not possible. I mean, national governments simply don't have the the geographic reach. They don't have the um, the incentives. Uh, they don't have a constituency which is coherent enough uh, to 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 make them take care of global long term issues, and they don't have exactly this uh, time horizon which is needed for many issues which are necessary for, for global, um, uh, global governance. Uh, so we can see this very clearly uh, with the sustainable development goals which have a time horizon uh, of many generations rather than the thought time horizons of most, most uh, decision makers in national governments who just want to maintain their power. I mean, even Angela Merkel is is, uh, is losing her power in a couple of weeks from now. So um, it is quite clear that there are asymmetries for national governments which make it possible uh, or very impossible for them to deal with some, uh, some global issues. And corruption was one of them. And when we started our work in 1993, uh, the governments of very, very good uh, countries, uh, very powerful countries, we are unable to do something about international corruption. I mean, the German government said uh, everybody is bribing, so I cannot stop the German businessmen, the German investors, the German uh, exporters from doing the same thing as everybody else does. And that was true also for the UK, for France, for for Japan, for Canada, practically all countries with the honorable exception of the United States where Jimmy Carter had introduced the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So it is quite clear that we need a, a different paradigm of, of global governance. And uh, therefore, we at Transparency International, we based our work very, very much exactly on this um, multi-stakeholder um, uh, collective action approach to governance issues. It started already in, in our first meetings uh, with biz big business, with government, and so on in the in the Aspen Institute in Berlin in 19, 1997, when, um, when we tried to get uh, convince uh, German business that it's much better for them to compete in a corruption-free international market than uh, to compete with others uh, who can bribe the best. And um, it was this uh, beginning at the Aspen Institute which led to the OECD Convention Against Foreign Bribery, when suddenly people understood that it was in the interest of everybody, um, of uh, governments, of um, the business community, uh, and in particular of civil society, uh, if you agree on stopping international corruption. And that's what we did. And many of our tools are exactly designed to bring these three actors of good governance together. I like to call them the triangle of good governance. Um, so uh, for instance, our whole approach to improve um, uh, integrity systems, uh, rather going after corrupt uh, 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 companies or corrupt uh, businessmen or corrupt uh, government officials uh, to shame and blame them and uh, get them prosecuted. This, this approach is always driven by the idea of getting these three actors together. 
and um, uh, and many of our tools. I don't want to uh, go into much detail because, in particular, my colleagues from Transparency International know uh, exactly um, these many, many hundreds of tools which we are using, which exactly reflect this um, triangle of good governance. Now, um, this has become even more prominent in uh, in additional. Uh, 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 institutions which we which we created. So the extractive industry transparency initiative not only works with governments and works with civil society and works with business. They are um, their decision making uh, body is composed of one third of uh, governments representatives of uh, governments of uh, natural resource rich countries and and home countries of big uh, companies of oil and gas and mining companies and of civil society organizations, 500 civil society organizations in a coalition for, for good um, uh, uh, extractive industry policies. And they have equal voting power in the um, in the board so, uh, and in the in the many in the membership meetings. So this is a, a very visible approach of bringing these three actors together. I mean, they are together. Uh, we should not ask so much on how we can incentivize others to help us. Uh, they should incentivize us. Um, very often, the initiatives for very good anti-corruption uh, measures come from business, uh, because very often they are the, 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 the greatest victims of uh, corruption by other businesses. Uh, very often, the good incentives come from governments. Uh, very often, newly elected uh, presidents or ministers, they are absolutely committed to fight corruption and announce this uh, uh, everywhere. So, I mean, this, uh, this EITI is a multi-stakeholder creation and has by now uh, uh, created a system where on oil and gas and mining, um, 54 countries have a better governance I mean, when we started that, um, uh, the uh, uh, the public did even, it didn't even know how, how much money, for instance, a government like Nigeria received from the mining companies, the oil and gas and mining companies. They received more than $50 billion every year. Every year, more than 50, in one year, $54 billion just from, from oil and gas companies. And this did not go into the government budget at the time. So the the, the national parliament didn't know anything about it. Uh, the media didn't know anything about it. Civil society didn't know it uh, until EITI uh, brought it out with a multi-stakeholder approach of, um, uh, of getting together to identify poor governance in the oil and gas and mining sector, to describe it, uh, to regularly report about uh, progress or problems and, um, and thereby um, uh, enable society uh, to take the political issues, of course, then to governments, so, um, through elected officials, through representative government in particular in democracies. So this is the way the three actors have to work together. And I can bring many, many examples. Um, I later, after I left um, EITI and after I left uh, TI, I uh, made this sort of my my mantra. Um, I went into difficult situations. I mean, I'm, I'm talking, for instance, about um, fisheries and uh, this very honest, wonderful country, Iceland, knows what I'm talking about when I talk about corruption in the fisheries sector. Um, we, we, we created an organization which has now several African coastal countries, uh, two Latin American countries, Indonesia, who are creating in their uh, fishery sector, multi-stakeholder working groups to identify poor governance, to make recommendations for improvements, and to publicize this. Um, we are trying to do this in many, many other sectors. So my argument is not only how do we incentivize um, the uh, business community to help us uh, to fight uh, corruption and to create better governance. Um, my recommendation really goes a step further. Uh, it says, let's try to create as many multi-stakeholder approaches in different in different uh, situations. And I think fighting corruption remains a very difficult 
situation as we can uh, as we have seen again uh, in the pandora's paper which just came out so corruption is still all over the place in spite of so many different people who are trying to fight it so um, i'm arguing uh, not only do we want to incentivize the others but we want to develop a system of uh, of cooperation of uh, uh, of uh, discussing with respect uh, with the other uh, uh, actors of society with the, with the other uh, constituencies, uh, and um, which would would be called, say, uh, by um, uh, by by many people, uh, uh, deliberative democracy. You know, where people openly discuss and understand and respect the interests and perspectives of others and bring them together. And this is what we what we uh, should do uh, to incentivize um, the private sector. Now, in my paper, uh, in the paper which we produced uh, um, uh, already seven years ago, we have a whole list of recommendations what uh, what one should do. The key findings of the survey where uh, over 220 experts worldwide have answered, um, but um, they are quite obvious. But uh, for me, the main direction is let's create multi-stakeholder approaches in order to deal with corruption and of course uh, the business community is one of the most important uh, uh, actors one of the three corners of this magical triangle a triangle of good governance thank you very much thank you peter um very interesting to hear your experience and uh, the uh, multi-stakeholder approach has indeed been one of your many successes, and in particular on the extractive industries. Just one follow-up question. I think it will be also, in, uh, and you are, uh, we hear now that you are strongly recommending this approach also for dealing with other issues. And I know that you are actively involved both on climate change and fisheries um, with this kind of approach. But could you tell us, elaborate a little bit on, you know, what are the, um, uh, obstacles. I mean, what are the challenging uh, challenges in creating such a, a dialogue between three very different stakeholders? Uh, what is your experience? Well, I mean, let me give you the example of one thing which failed. Uh, that was after Rana Plaza uh, was um, had this terrible accident with, with over a thousand uh, uh, women, men and women dying and so on. Uh, I became very concerned and uh, and I got uh, Angela Merkel, for instance, to say we need an EIATI type approach for the garment industry. She said this publicly somewhere. And so um, uh, since we have a very strong chapter in uh, Transparency International in Bangladesh with uh, 12,000 supporters, you know, um, I called them immediately and said, why don't we try to create something like EITI, but for the garment sector. So we bring together in each country, like in Bangladesh, but also in many other uh, countries where uh, people are being terribly exploited uh, in, in, uh, in, in the garment sector, uh, bring them together and uh, try to agree uh, in each country with uh, a standing committee of um, representatives of government, civil society, and private sector. I mean, the factory owners, for instance, uh, the labor unions, um, uh, but also the government. And um, uh, uh, you know that uh, Iftikhar um, is one of the best uh, TI members we have. And, um, and he immediately uh, picked this up and he invited me to come to Bangladesh. And in fact, in Germany, I, I got in, uh, Michael Otto, C and R, uh, uh, Chibo, and quite a number of companies interested in this matter. And we had a number of meetings in 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 Berlin in our office at the time. And um, uh, and in fact, uh, C and R paid my trip to go to Bangladesh, and I made there. A, a speech, you know, and uh, uh, and and uh, got a lot of support, and we had the first couple of sessions with the media, but also uh, already with a nascent multi-stakeholder group of about twenty people representing these different um, uh, stakeholders in in the garment sector. So I then continued this, and I got funding from the German Ministry of Ec of Economic Cooperation. And uh, with that, I organized a conference in, uh, in Myanmar. And um, uh, at that conference, uh, it did not go very well because there were quite a number of people from, 
from uh, also from India, from China, from Cambodia, from other countries which were not familiar enough. And so somehow we were not really able to make it a, a, a flaming success. But when we came back to Germany, the, the Ministry of Economy, uh, of Economic Cooperation uh, said, uh, we are going to support you and we are take, taking this over and we will, we will finance this. And so indeed we had a number of um, meetings, um, but then they called it the um, textile bündnis, and they basically took it in hand to decide whom to invite. Uh, they had big conferences inviting factory owners from Bangladesh and so on. And, um, and I joined them and uh, worked with them. But then they said, but if you create an NGA, a multi-stakeholder organization in Bangladesh, uh, you are not allowed to apply your sanctions if uh, any one of the stakeholders does not live up to their promises. But this was very important for us. I mean, in EITI, if a government does not allow civil society to come to the meetings, like uh, that was the, the situation we had in Equatorial Guinea, um, uh, and also to some extent um, uh, in, um, uh, in Ethiopia, um, then we would throw them out, you know, we suspend them and say, you cannot, you cannot be part of it. And, uh, uh, and the other said, the, the benefit of uh, being able to say to investors and so on, we are members of EITI. We report regularly on our problems in, um, in, in the governance situation. So um, they had an incentive to invite investors, while these people who had been thrown out didn't have this incentive. But we were told um, in the textile business, uh, saying this is now something which we haven't taken in hand, and uh, therefore you are not allowed to suspend and to do any of these sanctions without the approval of the government, of the German government. So uh, on that basis, um, uh, I lost interest in the matter. And then at, at one of the meetings, uh, we were excluded from uh, participating because we insisted that if we operate there, we want to be a fully fledged um, uh, civil society organization, a multi-stakeholder organization. And so I had meeting, uh, things like that, you know, where I didn't get funding, where I didn't get, or if I did get the support, the others would take it over. And I would say that uh, I had at least three other Initi initiatives like that. And at present, for instance, I'm trying to promote local access to electricity. And I've been working on this for, 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 uh, for since uh, 2018, basically as a successor organization, a successor initiative after the Africa Poor Gas Panel of Coffee and Annan. But I don't get the funding for it. So we are working right now in Senegal. We have a group which would like to meet, but they don't even have the money to, to rent a room in a hotel to have their first meeting. You know? And we in Germany or the, uh, here in Europe um, who are supporting this, we, we don't have the funds to travel. We don't have funds to organize conferences and so on. So either you don't, don't get the support or you get the support and it's taken over by somebody else. So it is not really uh, uh, a, a great success story, uh, what, what I'm uh, doing now in these various sectors. The FITI uh, has, has developed very well. I mean, they have their secretariat in the Seychelles. They have a couple of African countries, Latin America and, and Indonesia. But um, uh, the others is struggling. And this is why I have gray hair uh, and you don't. Um, but um, uh, EITI, of course, is a great is a great success story, and uh, and maybe the new government in Germany, uh, which will start to work um, hopefully next year, uh, will have an interest in this multi-stakeholder approach, which is of course a lot of work. It is a lot of patience, uh, a lot of uh, uh, frustrations, and so on. But eventually, it can succeed. Uh, when uh, sanctions and incentives alone, um, in particular against business, which is not uh, helping to fight corruption, if they don't succeed. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I, I hope to get back to some of these things uh, later on, but uh, now I hand it over to Karina to move on to the next speaker. Thanks, Gro. Uh, I will pass it to Thor uh, to present as well. Thank you so much, Todd. Thank you, Gro, and thank you, Peter. Hi, everyone. Lovely to see you. Um, it's a great honor for us at TI Iceland to 
introduce Francois Valerian. I'm sorry, my uh, pronunciation is not right. I want to start by highlighting his work on the Board of Transparency at the National France, where he um, contributed to the chapter's anti corruption advocacy around the offshore centers, uh, which we can see now uh, is incredibly important, and we see news of that every year with the latest leak. Uh, he is, um, Francois is a professor of finance and regulations and governance. He's also the editor, editor in chief of a French scientific journal, which I will not attempt to pronounce since my French is non existent. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, and he is the former leader of the Business Integrity Initiative at Transparency International and uh, initiated the advocacy at the G20 around financial regulations and anti corruption. So, um, Francois, take, take the way. So, many thanks, Dor, uh, Karina, and Guru. Uh, many thanks to TI Iceland, TI Norway, and TI Portugal as well as to Maria Joao and the EA Grants for your kind invitation to the launch of this important project. I I'm very pleased as well to be on this panel with my friends and colleagues, Peter Eigen, our founder, and Gillian Dell, who is doing so much as well. The subject of corporate social responsibility or, or the one of clean business is not new. These topics date back, according to some, to the pre-World War II period, certainly to the 1970s since when they have only grown in importance. And yet after decades of insistence on the social role of the corporation, we are still talking about it in terms sometimes comparable to those used by American consumer groups against General Motors in the late 1960s, so great are the challenges. Perhaps an important moment in the evolution of our relationship to corporate responsibility was the global financial crisis of 2008-2009. In the previous decade, there had been a lot of talk about the corporate social responsibility, the social role of business, and corporations themselves seem to have done a lot to extend their stakeholders to all of the populations affected by their activities. Then came the crisis. And with the crisis came the brutal realization that some large financial companies had knowingly neglected risk in order to increase their profits or market share in products they did not really understand, thus exposing the entire planet to a financial crisis unprecedented since the Second World War. Something has remained of this painful episode, a stronger demand from civil society, a demand that we hear again every time a problem arises a demand that we know is shared by a certain number of women and men in business. And we are also here to ensure that it is shared by the greatest number. This is why I'm pleased to participate in the launch of a beautiful project carried by three chapters of Transparency International in very different European countries, but all three aiming to engage the business sector in a path for expanding the UN Convention Against Corruption the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention and the UN Sustainable Development Goal 16 into corporate governance and corporate social responsibility with a view to increase the business sector participation and commitment towards human rights and sustainable development. The three TI chapters in Iceland, Norway, and Portugal are very active ones. We know how much we owe to Iceland in terms of awareness of the mistakes of under-regulated companies with the bankruptcy of the three main banks in this country in the fall of 2008 and the famous kitchenware revolution that followed. In 2021, the fight led by TI Iceland for peaceful business practices, practices respectful of civil society, public institutions, and press freedom is obviously in line with the tradition that had manifested itself in a striking way during the winter of 2009. For many years, TI Norway has been developing best practices in working with companies to prevent corruption in general, and in particular, of course, corruption in which Norwegian companies would be implicated outside the country. Despite Norway's excellent reputation, the latter is not purely theoretical. In the more or less recent past, large Norwegian companies were involved in bribery abroad. 
I mentioned bribes, but corruption is not just about bribes. Corruption is a whole economy that starts with the abuse of power at the expense of the public good, where the holder of that power is in partnership with private individuals or companies that pay him money. Now, what happens to that money? This is what is at stake in the current and global fight against corruption. And here also a good part of TI Portugal's work against golden visas, the use of free zones in Portugal or tax havens to launder illicit gains, and sometimes even the acquisition of financial institutions by the corrupt themselves. It is always easier when you are your own banker. Portugal, for historical reasons like France or the United Kingdom, is part of an international network that can contribute to the good development of economies, but can also favor illicit flows, as we saw again with the bankruptcy of Banco Espírito Santo in 2014. It is not always easy to speak precisely about companies from countries from which one does not come from, even if I'm speaking here as a representative of an international movement. As you know, and can also hear I'm French. And I will therefore also say a word about the numerous French corporations about the help and this bank in its agreement with the American justice system to elicit financial flows in various parts of the world, about the involvement of some gen, also acknowledged by this bank in bribe payments in Libya. It is usual to say that the global financial system is only as strong as its weakest links, and its weak links are very weak, and they were designed to be so. These are the offshore centers, whose role has been further illustrated by the recent publication of the Pandora Papers, centers to which the G20 and its London summit in 2009, 12 years ago, declared war, and which have never done so well. In 2009, investment from Bermuda, the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, and Luxembourg accounted for just under 14% of global cross-border investment flows of $20 trillion. Ten years later, in 2019, the latest year available in the IMF databases, of the $37 trillion in global cross-border investment flows, 16% came from those four small jurisdictions, two more percentage points and three more trillions of dollars. What's the problem, you might ask? If it's legal to do business in the jurisdictions of your choice, the problem is that even though these jurisdictions have on paper regulations requiring companies to declare their beneficial owners, there are no deterrent sanctions to compel companies to make this declaration and not to make a false one. The fine in Luxembourg for not having complied with this declaration is between 1,250 euros and 1,250,000 euros. And only if you have been identified by a regulator that obviously does not have the means to control everyone. The problem is that despite this, each of the 30 largest banks in the world has significant activities in at least one of these four jurisdictions. It is also true that some international companies choose not to have any activities in offshore centers, while others, few in number, publish a report every year explaining the reasons for their possible activities in such centers. These are obviously aspects that are now scrutinized by global civil society. What is the point of going through the Cayman Islands or even Luxembourg when you want to invest, say from, from France, in an African or Asian country? There are only two reasons for that. Either it is illegal money that you want to hide entirely, or it is legal money, but you simply do not want to pay taxes, almost no, on what you will get from it. In both cases, you make a victim, the harmonious development of the world. You may be clean at home and not so clean abroad. The three countries that are the center of the project launch today do not score badly on the TI Corruption Perceptions Index, which measures the perception of corruption of public institutions within the countries. Out of 179 countries, Norway is seventh, Iceland 17th, and Portugal 33rd. Nevertheless, when you look at the degree of implementation of the OECD anti-bribery convention, Norway and Portugal 
only have moderate levels of implementation according to our Exporting Corruption 2020 report. Even more concerning is the data published annually by the IMF on cross-border investments. In 2019, of the $9 billion Iceland invested abroad, $2.5 billion were invested in Luxembourg. Of the $150 billion invested by Norway, $13 billion were in Luxembourg, $4 billion in Bermuda, and $1 billion in the Cayman Islands. And of the $161 billion that left Portugal, $31 went to Luxembourg. And once again, we are confronted with the question, what if all this or part of it was legal? To this question, I answer with other questions. What is the need from Norway to invest in Bermuda or the Cayman Islands? Is it to invest massively in local tourism? Or is it to avoid paying taxes in the country of final investment, in Norway or in both countries? Let us talk about France. When the French oil giant Total, very official, exploits Myanmar gas through a company registered in Bermuda. Why Bermuda? Why are there other shareholders in this Bermuda-based company in addition to Total? Why is the identity of these shareholders not published? We all know how respectful the Myanmar government is of human rights. Let us also remember that clean at home may become dirty at home. The scandal that hit Danish and Swedish banks a few years ago reminds us that some countries with an impeccable reputation for integrity can be targeted by criminals who want to launder their earnings for two reasons. First, who would suspect a Scandinavian bank? You would suspect a French bank, but a Scandinavian bank, more difficult. And second, in countries where problems are rare, the regulator is often not very strong and does not have the capacity to spot problems and adequately monitor financial flows. Our colleagues at Transparency Canada, faced with similar problems, call this snow washing. I've talked a lot about the international flows that companies are now immersed in and have to pay close attention to. What happens inside the company, however, is as always of the utmost importance. We all know that anti-corruption programs, training, controls are crucial. The deficiency of internal controls obviously played a key role in the non dramatic case that I have just mentioned about Scandinavia. What is striking in several recent cases, however, is the extent to which high-profile companies were run by men who were completely obli oblivious to ethical rules. The Wirecard scandal in Germany, so a company that was very much in the forefront in a country that is rather well known for its regulation. A company listed on the stock exchange whose top managers for years published false accounts. And this 20 years after the bankruptcy of Enron in the United States, and whilst thousands, tens of thousands of additional pages of financial regulation have been published by the world's main economic powers. I would also like to talk about Renault, a well-known French car maker, and its former CEO, Carlos Ghosn. Mr. Ghosn chose to escape from the Japanese justice system, which had several very serious charges against him. So there was no trial. There may never be one. But does that mean, because Mr. Ghosn has expected from his house arrest, that we cannot comment on what seems to have happened? If we stick to what the Japanese justice system is accusing him of, the former CEO of the Renault Nissan Group used various means to increase his income without either the shareholders or the employees knowing about it. In fact, without anyone knowing about it until the Japanese employees of the group probably handed a thick file to the prosecutor. Renault has since filed a complaint. Why didn't Renault file a complaint when Carlos Ghosn was still the CEO? The answer seems simple, almost obvious. Ghosn was a CEO. The company cannot file a complaint against its CEO. But it's this obvious answer that poses a problem that poses the problem of the exercise of power in modern corporations. In many countries, rule of law has developed with numerous checks and balances that allow the power 
exercised by the woman or men at the top of the hierarchy to be controlled. The same is not true, or at least not to the same extent within the corporation. There is a lot of talk about corporate governance, a fairly general concept that is useful but often too vague, but not enough about corporate government, government and not governance, and the need to avoid a system of unchecked monarchy within the company. Wirecard. Renault. Some business leaders have proven to be the worst enemies of our society's acceptance of business, enemies far worse than the most radical anti-business activists. The compliance function obviously plays a key role in checking how power is exercised at the top, but also at all levels of the corporation. Fraud and corruption within the corporation often stem from an abuse of power by managers who are not necessarily looking for their own gain, but who are eager to do anything to win a contract or succeed in a project, or who feel protected by their supervisors who set a bad example and abuse their power themselves. From this point of view, the existence of individual sanctions, individual sanctions, against acts of corruption committed within the company is of the utmost importance. Not only do these sanctions have a clear deterrent effect, but their mere existence also enables corporate executives to refuse to commit certain offenses, such as using a drug use intermediary to obtain a contract, because they can tell their own supervisors that they are running a personal risk by doing so. The existence of individual sanctions is also the protection of individuals within the corporation. I talked about the economics of corruption in terms of the abuse of power and the reinvestment of the gains from that abuse. I would like to conclude my remarks again on an economic note. A corporation's activity is directed towards a certain number of stakeholders, customers, suppliers, employees, share or bondholders, governments. But there are also other stakeholders those I call neglected stakeholders, who are subjected to potentially harmful activities by the corporation without having any say in the way the corporation operates. When a corporation concludes agreements with a repressive government that allow it to finance the continuation of repression, the entire population becomes a neglected stakeholder. These are negative externalities to remain in economics, which unbalance our societies in the same way that carbon emissions unbalance our planet. Fighting against corruption is therefore fighting against these negative externalities that corporate activity may produce. We all know that there are many women and men inside corporations who want to work for the good of our societies and who are convinced that the long-term success of their corporations cannot be based on the destruction of common good. It is with these women and men that TI Iceland, TI Norway, and TI Portugal, as well as our whole global movement, look forward to working in the fight against corruption in this multi-stakeholder collective action that our friend Peter Eigen in some way invented. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Natasha. But I, thank you for a great talk. Um, I think I'm going to follow in Grove's uh, footstep and, and ask a question. But if anyone has any questions, then just please send it in the in the chat, and you can have that. You can ask. So um, I have a question that is quite uh, relevant for here, us here in Iceland. We have a um, often have a hard time when it comes to co cooperation in kind of where we should draw the line uh, in what you could maybe talk about as bad actors or kind of inefficient actors where they would love to be seen as cooperating but actually don't necessarily want to contribute much. Um, and although we agree that, that the only way forward is to cooperate and, and have multi-stakeholders, we often do find this balance a bit tricky. So um, I'm wondering if words of wisdom on that. Um, right, it's, a, it's clear an issue. And um, uh, I'd be interested in Petra's views on that as well. But we've all seen um, multi-stakeholder multi conversations 
um, social responsibility fora where you have genuine corporations and people who really try to work and to work hard for the common good and also to, to listen to civil society and to, to progress at the goal. And you also have other actors who clearly do not follow that path. And they are there because they have to be there because within those corporations, you have people simply paid to work with us and to talk to us and that's it. And these people themselves, even if these people are genuine in what they are doing, they do not have access to the people on the ground and the field. And there is this complete separation within the corporation between those who talk to the outside world and those on the field who are doing anything to win contracts. So I think it is for us an element of caution. And it's very important we engage into multi-stakeholder approaches, into dialogue, into conversations. But as Peter said, there are also sanctions for those that behave badly. And we, have, we always have to be able, and that's what our TI chapters, for example, are doing when we are engaging with corporations. We always have to be able to suspend the relationship. When we see that a, an actor, a player, is not playing the game as it is supposed to play it. And, and we are suspending the relationship, and also it is a way for us to have a lever. And this lever is the lever of the opinion. Why have things evolved so much? Why are we having this webinar tonight or this afternoon? Because the global opinion and the opinions in our countries have evolved. And it's this evolution which is the clear factor that will make hopefully all corporations or most of them play their role and play the game in an authentic manner. Thank you. Uh, no one else has asked for uh, to ask a question, but you actually referred to Peter. Peter, do you want to comment before we move on to the next? Speaker? Yeah, but I have to admit, I didn't quite get the, the question which uh, Francois asked. I mean, I have a very interesting example exactly of the, um, the point which he mentioned about uh, having to let go of people um, if who don't live up to the expectations. And that is um, the behavior of Siemens uh, with Transparent International. I mean, they became corporate members of Siemens and became very supportive uh, of Transparency International. Um, uh, in fact, they helped us in the very beginning to get access to quite a number of uh, uh, important um, uh, people in, uh, in Germany and helped us to get um, access uh, to a lot of other businessmen who were later supporting us. But, and I was attacked for uh, allowing Siemens to join us as a corporate member because they said they only do this as a, as a fig leaf uh, I said, uh, fig leaf is okay as long as it is transparent, you know. But uh, I see that you are not smiling at all, uh, Gro, about this joke. But um, and, uh, when they eventually uh, were found out to have violated the, um, the, the agreements with us uh, or cooperation, um, we suspended them. And uh, that was long before uh, their um, slush funds in Vienna have been discovered. And, um, and so at the time, the very big scandal came up and they had to pay about $2 billion in fines and, uh, and lawyer's fees and most of their uh, top um, uh, managers were fired and, and so on. At that time, uh, they had uh, very long left Transparency International because they had been suspended by us because of earlier uh, corruption cases. So this is a very good example on how difficult it is to deal with uh, issues like that. Uh, I, mean, I remember a time when S SGS, the, uh, the Swiss um, uh, uh, security firm SGS tried to to join us um, the, um, while they were prosecuted because of uh, corruption cases in in Pakistan. Um, we we did not accept their 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 support uh, because we knew this was simply done in order to 
uh, use our names and so on. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's an art to, to find good partners and uh, to work with them closely. And some people succeed. I mean, in the case of the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, for instance, um, the, the uh, American oil companies uh, threatened us uh, because we were supporting the Dodd-Frank Act, which was um, uh, demanding information for individual um, uh, projects, you know, which we at EITI had not dem uh, demanded uh, because we are much more incremental, gradually build building up the conditionality of belonging to EITI. And, uh, and later on, they even, um, uh, the Association of American Oil Companies even sued uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, Federal Trade, uh, not Federal Trade Commission, the Security and Exchange Commission, when they issued um, uh, uh, decrees to implement uh, the George Franks Act. And, and under President uh, Trump, uh, the, the, uh, the Americans left EITI. Now, under the new uh, governance in, in, in the United States, they have rejoined and so on. But it shows what a, what a difficult subject it is, um, uh, multi-stakeholder decision-making. Uh, but I, I still believe it is in many, many cases where you otherwise cannot make any progress, um, it is absolutely necessary. And I can bring many examples of that. But what was your question, uh, Francois? I didn't, I'm sorry, I was, must have been dreaming or something. No, no, I think you answered my question even without hearing it. So my, my question was about the, the oh, Tor's question actually was about the, the failures that we have and the risk to engage with corporations, which may end up not playing the game, but it's exactly the example that you Yeah. No, that's a very good question, and and uh, I hope my answer um, uh, tells you what what I had in mind. Uh, I have many other examples like that, and uh, and uh, and I think uh, one should uh, be very careful not to allow uh, others to uh, to take um, the the name and the image and so on, which comes with uh, Transparency International, simply as a shield against criticism but rather lure them in through, um, uh, through cooperation and respect. And, uh, uh, and that is, in my opinion, what we are trying to do at TI. All right. Thank you, Peter and Francois. I'm going to pass the ball over to Karina. Um, thank you. Thank you, Thor. Uh, so now, my pleasure to, to introduce Jill and Dell. Uh, our colleague at uh, TI Secretariat in Berlin, um, where she acts as head of the conventions program, working on issues related to grand corruption impunity, foreign bribery enforcement, asset recovery, and international anti-corruption conventions. Gillian co-authored 10 editions of the Exporting Corruption Report about OECD convention enforcement. And in 2016, in 2016, she co-founded uh, what I think is one of our greatest achievements, the UNCAC Coalition, a global a civil society network dedicated to the implementation of the UN Convention Against Corruption, presenting groundbreaking recommendations to change the world for a better place. Thank you very much, Gillian, for, for your, your availability and also for being so kind in sharing your most valuable expertise today. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Karina. Greetings to all from Berlin. Thank you to the three TI chapter organizers for the invitation to speak at the launch of this important initiative. I agree with Peter and Francois that it is crucial to work with the interested business community to tackle issues relating to say sustainable development, human rights and bribery in international business transactions. In the case of this initiative, that means the business community in Iceland, Norway, and Portugal. Well, Peter has given important historical background on the genesis of the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention to tackle corruption in international business transactions. And he also told how we built a coalition with governments and private sector to achieve its adoption and sub subsequently work with them to achieve its implementation. Francois and Peter were also talking about sanctions for poor performance 
of partners in the multi-stakeholder context. I'll be talking now about another kind of sanctions in relation to foreign bribery, and then that is sanctions in the context of foreign bribery enforcement, because we need the support of the business community for that too. In my remarks, I'll focus on some trends in foreign bribery enforcement, as well as trends in the understanding of the harm caused by for foreign bribery, including adverse human rights impacts. This is intended as a contribution to a discussion um, among your um, uh, constituency of risks for companies associated with foreign bribery. Before looking at this trend, th those trends, let's recall that the concern about foreign bribery dates back to the 1970s and has generated a growing set of progressively stronger and more detailed instruments for addressing the problem. These range from the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, first adopted in 1976, through the OECD anti-bribery convention in 1997, to the UN Convention Against Corruption in 2003, and the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Not all of them focused entirely on foreign bribery, but all of them covering it in some way. Most recently, the UN General Assembly adopted a political declaration at its special session against corruption, which also addresses some of the issues relating to foreign bribery. And I'll refer to some of these in my remarks as I go along. Now, looking first at trends in, in enforcement, let's start with Transparency's Exporting Corruption Report 2020 that Francois referred to. In the report, we assessed country enforcement performance. We looked at 43 of the 44 parties to the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention, unfortunately not including Iceland. And we also included four leading exporters that are not party to the convention, are also bound by the obligation in the UN Convention Against Corruption to criminalize foreign bribery. Those four are China, Hong Kong, India, and Singapore. The report places countries in bans according to level of enforcement. And this is based on data on different stages of the enforcement process, such as investigations, cases opened, and cases closed. Our system is quite generous in terms of threshold, thresholds for upward movement in the bands, and it takes into account a country's share of world trade. The report also includes individual country assessments of legal framework and enforcement system and recommendations for improvement. Regarding the enforcement bans, there was some good news and some bad news. Starting with the bad news, the number of active enforcers went down from seven in our 2018 report to four in 2020, with Germany, Italy, and Norway all moving down. Not only that, but a couple of the active enforcers, the UK and Switzerland, had enforcement levels that declined but we're still high enough for them to stay in the active band. The majority of countries, including the non-OECD convention countries, remained in the limited and little or no enforcement bands. The good news was that two countries with a significant share of world exports moved up to the moderate band. Those are France and Spain. The other good news was that enforcement by the United States, the world's leading enforcer, remained very high. So in the period 2016 to 2019 that we were covering, the US concluded 130 cases with sanctions, recovering more than 2 billion in penalties in three of those years and over 1 billion in the other year. And as you probably know, the US does not enforce only against domestic companies, but also against foreign ones, often using uh, Ex uh, exercise of very extensive jurisdiction. In the years 2018 and 2019, there were more enforcement actions against foreign companies than against US companies. So even if your country is doing a poor job of enforcement, the US may catch your com country's companies in its enforcement net. Now, what about the performance of Iceland, Portugal, and Norway? Since Iceland wasn't covered in our report, I'll refer to a recent OECD Working Group on Bribery Phase 4 report on Iceland 
from December 2020. According to that report, the working group on bribery is, quote, seriously concerned that since the entry into force of the convention in Iceland over 20 years ago, Iceland has yet to conclude a foreign bribery case. And where credible allegations of foreign bribery involving Icelandic nationals or companies have been reported, the allegations were not assessed and investigated. The OECD report did note that in 2019, Iceland commenced an investigation into the so-called Namibia case, also known as the fish rot case, involving alleged bribery paid by the um, Heji group. And um, as Francois mentioned, Norway and Portugal landed in the moderate category in our enforcement table. For Norway, that meant that in the four year period covered, enforcement authorities opened two investigations, commenced no cases, and concluded two cases with sanctions. In the same period, Portuguese authorities opened four investigations, com commenced one case, and concluded no cases with sanctions. Now, those numbers probably sound low to you. Um, that's because those countries' share of world exports are not that great. So that's part, part of the weighting that puts them in the um, moderate category. Iceland's is very tiny. And in the case of both Portugal and Norway, it's well under 1%. In Norway and Portugal, we found several deficiencies in the legal framework and enforcement system. And by we, I mean our chapters in Norway and Portugal. And those indicate that more political will is needed to ensure robust enforcement. And the OECD also made a whole set of recommendations to Iceland. Now I'd like to mention seven trends in and around foreign bribery enforcement, all of which potentially affect company risks in relation to foreign bribery, and therefore should be of interest in your discussions um, with, with uh, companies. Trend number one relates to beneficial ownership transparency. In many foreign bribery cases, a key vehicle for making corrupt payments and laundering the proceeds of corruption is the anonymous shell company. And we have long argued that this needs to be addressed with central public registers. There's some big news on this subject today. The FATF plenary has been meeting and reviewing FATF recommendations, including recommendation 24 on beneficial ownership transparency, and has decided to propose a requirement that countries set up a beneficial ownership register or use an alternative system that has the same efficiency. The FATF proposal will also encourage public registers. This greatly enforces a trend in that direction, in particular, the EU requirement for central public registers. This should make it easier to detect and investigate foreign bribery cases and related money laundering. Trend number two concerns non-trial resolutions, which are, according to uh, one definition, any form of resolution short of a full trial. Settlements are often a cost-effective way to resolve complex corruption cases and obtain a substantial money, monetary settlement. With the constraints on resources and capacity faced by en en national enforcement authorities and courts, these resolutions are an attractive option and have been introduced in recent years in a growing number of jurisdictions, both civil and common law. Having this option does seem to boost enforcement. At the same time, its use poses challenges that we should be aware of. As noted by the UN FACTI panel report issued in February 2021, that's the UN High Level Panel on International Financial Accountability, Transparency and Integrity for Achieving the 2030 Agenda. There are concerns about the lack of safeguards, lack of cooperation with demand side countries, lack of transparency, insufficient sanctions, and lack of victim compensation in connection with non-trial resolutions. We have also raised these and other concerns. There are 
Interesting developments in the area of non-trial resolutions to follow in the context of the UNGAS political declaration, that's the UN General Assembly Special Session Against Corruption political declaration, and the OECD Working Group on Bribery's revisions to its anti-bribery recommendation that are currently underway and are expected to be published in December. Trend number three is about the accountability of the enablers in foreign bribery cases. And it's really more of a mini trend. The enablers have so far gotten off pretty lightly, if not to say scot-free in foreign bribery enforcement. There's a slight trend in the direction of holding financial institutions accountable for anti-money laundering fa failures connected to foreign bribery. Taking again the fish rot case, in May 2021, the, um, the Norwegian bank DNB was fined $48 million by the Norwegian financial supervisor for anti-money laundering violations in connection with that case. There are also examples of similar fines against financial institutions in the Netherlands and Switzerland. These are small steps and much more is needed. In particular, there's still thus far almost no accountability in foreign bribery cases for professional intermediaries such as lawyers, accountants, trust services, and company service providers. Trend number four relates to enforcement on the demand side of foreign bribery. There's long been a concern about lack of enforcement against the public officials on the receiving end of foreign bribery. And companies have in particular highlighted claims that the bribes are being extorted with impunity. This has led to pressures to increase supply side enforcement against those foreign public officials. And criminalization is in fact foreseen under both the Council of Europe uh, Criminal Law Convention Against Corruption um, and under the UNCAC, the UN Convention Against Corruption, Article 16. In fact, the US already does go after foreign public officials in some cases, as the Mozambique hidden bonds case shows. Equally important is another mini trend of increased enforcement action activity on the demand side of foreign bribery, um, which might have to do with action on the supply side. We see examples in the, again, in the Namibian fish rot case and cases, for example, arising out of the Brazilian Lava Jato operation. The latter included proceedings against two Norwegian companies that we know of. In terms of company risk, demand side enforcement is interesting because it may be accompanied by enforcement against the bribe paying companies in the affected country as well as is happening in Namibia in the fish rot case. Although it has to be said that the enforcement authorities in the affected country may be hard pressed to conduct complex international um, compl uh, corruption investigations and prosecutions without support. In any event, we can ex expect some new complexities from these trends. Trend number five relates to the role of public interest organizations in initiating foreign bribery proceedings. This is thus far also a minor trend, but and occurring especially in civil law ju jurisdictions, which offer the avenue of parti civile. In Switzerland, for example, the Swiss NGO Public Eye filed two criminal complaints, which led to Swiss investigations of the activities of commodity trading company Glencore in the DRC and of the Swiss bank Credit Suisse in Mozambique. There are signs that this kind of activity is set to increase, including by NGOs from victim countries. An example of that is the complaint filed in Portugal a month ago by three Angolan non-governmental organizations relating to alleged corruption and money laundering schemes carried out by former managers of Sonangol, Angola's state oil company, including allegedly Vice President Manuel Vicente. The allegations of corruption refer to bribe payments by the company SBM and describe Portugal as the launderette for illicit funds from corruption in Angola. Uh, trend number six in, in enforcement relates to international cooperation. Obstacles in this area often slow or even stymie foreign bribery enforcement 
and raise its costs. There are some gradual developments in this area. The US, the leading enforcer, is increasingly cooperating with other countries in foreign bribery enforcement. This dates back to the uh, Siemens case in 2008 and the BAE case in 2010, um, with increasing re recent examples, including the Airbus and Od Odebrecht case settlements. There are signs that this kind of cooperation is increasing among other countries too. It should be noted that there's a lack of guidelines in this area and demand side countries sometimes complain that they are excluded. Another important development for international cooperation was the establishment of tw in 2017 of the International Anti-Corruption Coordination Center based in the UK, which brings together specialist law enforcement officers from multiple agencies around the world to tackle allegations of grand corruption, including bribery of public officials and money laundering. There are six countries currently that are members um, and, and since uh, 2020, the um, uh, center also includes associate me members. There's currently talk of expanding the membership and the associate membership and making this coordination center stronger, which could greatly enhance international cooperation. This year also, a new global operational network of anti-corruption agencies or GLOBE network was established with uh, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime as secretariat. And it offers a new platform for information exchange between anti-corruption law enforcement practitioners, which is open to all countries. It remains to be seen how it will function, but it's another step towards more cooperation. We believe this goes in the right direction and that more should be done to build up international infrastructure to tackle cross-border crime and corruption. This could potentially mean creation of an international anti-corruption agency to handle cases where national authorities fail to do so. That was a proposal of the International Bar Association's Anti-Corruption Working Group to the UN General Assembly Special Section Against Corruption. In my final comments, I'd like to touch briefly on another trend, which is more of a discussion trend so far about recognizing the harm from foreign bribery and the rights of victims to remedy. There may have been a time when foreign bribery was regarded as a victimless crime, and if it ever was, that time is, is past. It's in fact uncontestable that there is harm from foreign bribery. This was already recognized in the preamble to the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention, which talks about how bribery in international business transactions undermines good governance and economic development and distorts international competitive conditions. The UN Convention Against Corruption also refers to problems and threats posed by corruption to the stability and security of societies, um, undermining democracy, ethical values and justice, and jeopardizing sustainable development and the rule of law. Now, these are general harms to society, and it is also possible to speak about categories such as adverse human rights impacts and environmental impacts. In fact, neither of the two preambles or documents I quoted actually refer to human rights violations, but the international recognition of the link between corruption and adverse human rights impacts has been growing at least since the early 2000s. Francois Apley referred to an appreciation of negative externalities, and those are some. After years of work in 2011, the Human Rights Council endorsed the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And these really gave a push to making the connection between corruption and human rights, business corruption and human rights. The principles establish a framework with three pillars consisting of the state duty to protect human rights, the corporate duty to respect human rights, and the need for effective access to remedy. And the commentary to the first pillar makes clear that the state duty includes the obligation to enforce anti-bribery laws. 
More recently, the UNGAS political declaration recognizes in its preamble, the negative impact that all forms of corruption have on human rights, as well as referring to other harms. So the connection between human rights and, and corruption, together with increasing due diligence obligations, have led to efforts to provide guidance to companies on combining human rights and com corruption human uh, due diligence, such as that from Global Compact in 2016, and in 2020 from the um, organization business at OECD. This naturally connects with the issue of victims remedies and reparations, which is also relevant for companies, you know, con considering risks in the international, um, in international markets and the international business environment. In 2003, UNCAC in Article 35 already included an obligation for states to provide a right of victims of corruption to initiate legal proceedings against those responsible for their damage. And also, Pillar 3 of the UN Guiding Principles is all about remedies. So there is now a major debate underway about what kind of harms can be recognized, what what people qualify as victims, people or groups, and what are the rights of victims representatives to initiate proceedings? This very subject was um, uh, the focus of heated debate in the OECD Working Group on Bribery in its discussions that are still underway on the revisions to the anti-bribery rec recommendation. And it could have in the future, major implications for the outcomes of foreign bribery enforcement. So those are the few observations and trends I wanted to share with you. I hope that the um, spotlight on these trends will help to provide a background to the important work of your initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gillian. Uh, for your in-depth uh, explanation about everything that's happening at, uh, at the global level. So um, I have also a question to you, uh, very specific, and I wanted to, to extend this question to, to Peter and Francois, if they, they also wish to, to, to say something about it, because it is core from the project where, that we're trying to, to develop. So you have been working on strengthening the, the enforcement of such relevant international OECD uh, anti-bribery convention uh, as well as the UNCAC. But sometimes we feel that these international commitments at the national level, they don't translate to, to actual change. Uh, let's put it like this. Um, and, and, and sometimes they are not always perceived as mandatory by other stakeholders outside, outside, outside the, the government, uh, especially when they translate to practice and to corporate practice, to be, to be more specific. So what do you think can be done at the government level, you know, aside laws and regulations uh, that are written uh, and they can be downloaded uh, by whoever wishes to do so, but sometimes they are not uh, fully uh, understood uh, by, by, by business leaders especially when we are dealing with uh, uh, small and medium uh, size enterprises. I don't know if you are aware, but for example, in Portugal, 95, almost 95% are a business sector is made of small and medium sized enterprises, sometimes micro enterprises, you know, family businesses. And um, these people, uh, uh, and this is, we, we hear it often, is that they don't have the resources, neither the human resources, neither the money, to hire, you know, big shot companies uh, from audit firms or, or consultancy firms. So uh, we are trying to do our job uh, with this project, which is to, you know, support in any way we can as, as civil society activists working on anti-corruption and anti-bribery. But what do you think can governments do to, to, to increase enforcement and, and to be more effective? in, in anti-bribery, especially in, in international trade, uh, which is uh, uh, for uh, our countries, uh, a, key, a, key, a key area of our sustainable development. 
our economic development. Thank you. Thanks, Karina. That's a really um, good question, and we could discuss that for a while. I, I do think it, it can be easy to get discouraged um, with the you know, progress with implementation of international frameworks. Um, but I do also think that there is progress, even if we find it too slow. And we sometimes see that when in the enforcement area, when suddenly a country starts showing up on our enforcement table as, as happened with um, France and Spain, uh, showing up on the higher levels, let's say. Um, I think also that was, you know, some changes in frameworks, um, partly resulting or maybe fully resulting from international standards and commitments happened in Brazil and, and were part of what made uh, the Lava Jato case, cases possible. So we have to hold on to those um, uh, examples of progress. We, we may also, you know, we, we could dig deeper and it may be that Namibia's enforcement now in the fish rot case also has been made possible or stronger through changes they've made by implementing international conventions. Now, how can we do more? I think what you're doing is exactly right in this initiative, in this multi-stakeholder initiative. We need to build multi-stakeholder support and to put pressure on governments to take these issues more seriously. Um, of course, that's not all, what all of that your, your initiative is about, but I would imagine that in coming together and discussing these issues with, with companies, um, that could very well be one of the outcomes. And um, I also want to say that we, we you know, believe so strongly in that, that um, some time ago, uh, we at the Secretariat, but with support from many chapters, we produced a guide on working with the private sector um, to advance um, international anti-corruption convention implementation. So there's some thoughts in there, um, but you're right that the, the, the SME um, part of the business community is special because they have little time uh, to devote to these efforts. They're, they're very busy keeping their companies going. Um, so I, I would think that, you know, any way you can help them to quickly understand issues, to support their efforts. We, we also developed an SME version of the uh, business principles many years ago. Um, so, you know, any, any kind of um, support you can give them, I think will, would, would greatly help to, you know, have them involved um, as much as possible, given it, despite their time constraints. So those are a few thoughts. Thanks, Guillain. Peter, Francois, I don't know if you have anything to add to, to what Guillain said. Um, well, yes. Uh, a, a, a few comments, yes. Uh, I fully agree with Gillian that, uh, and with you, Karina, that it's difficult to, to address SMEs also because they don't have time. As you said, Karina, they don't have a, uh, you know, people within the, the firm, the small business, the small family business to, to simply be informed about uh, all those regulations and all the things that they have to do. Uh, it, it's a topic that Gillian and I happened to discuss a few days ago, and we, we are also thinking about the supply chain. And it, it, it's difficult for us as a, as a movement with limited resources, even if we have a big movement or arguably the biggest anti-corruption movement worldwide, but, but still with limited resources, it's difficult for us to target all companies in a country. It's not possible. Now, working with uh, important businesses or with the government or with public administrations, 
and trying to use them as levers to um, diffuse, to, 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 to expand uh, our uh, asks through the supply chain so that these companies are also helping us preach, uh, uh, emphasize the importance of a certain number of behaviors of internal policies. So that's, that's, that's a possibility. Uh, it's something that well, a number of, chap of chapters and also uh, uh, TIS have been doing in the past. It is not easy. It is not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. But well, there, is not, there are not many ways and probably going through the clients or suppliers of these SMEs uh, is worth exploring. Now on the enforcement of international conventions, I think it's a very, very important issue. And I think that as a, as a movement, we are at a, at a turning point or in a transition because the movement has been extremely successful in particular Peter, but also Gillian as um, uh, having big international instruments in place signed by many countries, so the OECD convention and in the late 90s, then the ANCAC in 2005, other important conventions. So what we have achieved was that almost all governments worldwide have signed against corruption, have committed to having um, strong public institutions against corruption, strong regulations. Now, what are we observing that Many of them, let's say most of them, are not doing much. So we have, but, but it's already an achievement for us as a civil society, we have put them into a contradiction and a public one. And I think it has, it has an enormous value, an enormous potential value in terms of our advocacy. I'm always thinking of something which was important in Europe because well, we are here in a European uh, panel uh, that was important in the 1970s. That was the Helsinki Agreement in 1975. So there was an agreement signed by European countries, West and East, plus the USSR, plus the USA. And this agreement was fairly precise in terms of respecting human rights. And obviously, well, the um, Soviet bloc did not have the same conception of human rights as other countries, but there were groups that formed in these countries that tried to defend and publicly defend the signature of their countries on the NCT agreement. Some of these groups were called Helsinki, Helsinki Charter. There, there, there were those groups in, well, in uh, Czechoslovakia or other countries also in, in, in the from Russia. Um, and that was important. And 15 years after, it brought about change in their country. So it takes time, but I think it's important. What are we doing on the G20? The G20 doesn't have any um, legal structure. It is not a legal body. It is, you know, you have like 19 governments plus the European Union playing the global government and issuing declarations and statements but some of them have been very precise, in particular on corruption. And all of these governments, well, arguably are not the biggest fighters against corruption, since still they signed. They signed and they committed to fight against corruption. And now the transition, because I was mentioning transition to our movement, is to uh, publicize these contradictions and to try to help the people within these countries who are trying to advocate for their countries to respect their signature and their commitments and to really be serious about these commitments. It's a bit like the companies that Peter was, was mentioning before and Demons who was not serious. Now, you can't play that, that game too long. Sooner or later, you know, uh, 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 history is, uh, is, uh, is uh, taking up with you, like Gorbachev will say. So um, yes, that's, those are a few, a few thoughts that I have. Thanks, Francois. Uh, uh, Karina, I also say a few words. I mean, we have basically 
um, asked us to make a contribution on how uh, business sector participation and commitment towards human rights and sustainability uh, can be uh, motivated, can be strengthened. And maybe in this connection, I simply read you six principles, which have been um, uh, the result of this report, which I mentioned to you earlier, um, which our governance tool has produced. Um, and this, which is based on a, on a survey of uh, more than 200 experts. I um, mean, the first um, principle is impact. So be relevant and proportional. So this is extremely important when you try to do something in order to convince business to join your, your battles. Uh, secondly, communication. If nobody knows, nobody cares. And that is, of course, a question of transparency. And we just mentioned an example in this context. Uh, Francois talked about the G20. Um, the G20 had the big problem for a long time as far as climate change is concerned, that um, there were so many different opinions of, uh, on climate change. I mean, the American government um, under Trump um, thought that uh, there is no man-made uh, man warming, um, global warming. And, um, and kept, for instance, the World Bank and so on from getting deeply involved in this. So um, uh, we started at um, our Humboldt Viadrina governance platform, as it is called right now. It's not a governance school anymore. Uh, we have started a climate transparency program, and we brought together 14 different think tanks and NGOs all over the world, South Africa, China, Argentina, many in Europe, to bring together the data which are relevant uh, about uh, this argument that man-made um, uh, global warming has to be uh, stopped. And uh, we just issued last week our report for this year in preparation of, uh, of COP26, in which we made very, very clear uh, comparisons between the climate policies of the G20 governments. And in fact, this is very effective and uh, uh, highly uh, appreciated by many uh, governments, including the German government, which has been supporting this, but also a number of uh, foundations and so on. So you, you have to simply find a niche where you, where you have something to offer. And uh, on this question communication, if nobody knows, nobody cares, uh, this is exactly where, uh, where you have to uh, make a contribution to, uh, to business people, in particular young business people who want to have an interesting and good life in front of them and not go around and bribe everybody. The third uh, uh, portion was monitoring. Trust is good, monitoring is necessary. So, I mean, these um, uh, uh, compliance um, uh, uh, departments, which are being established in many companies uh, and uh, compliance advisors uh, helping medium and small scale companies are extremely important. Uh, they can help to, to uh, monitor. Uh, the next, um, uh, the, the fourth um, principle is multiplication, seek allies. So this is extremely important. If I'm uh, a baker and, uh, and you, I manage to get all the other bakers in my town to join me, if you don't want to have child labor or if you don't want to, uh, to break the law in other ways, then this helps. You know, this is a collective action. Um, so seek allies. Um, uh, the, the next principle they recommend in this report um, is uh, create a snowball effect uh, about responsibility. Now it's quite clear that uh, this can be very exciting um, if people are um, enthusiastic of what they see uh, done by others and they would like to copy it and perhaps in a given sector develop a real campaign in this area. Uh, today we had, for instance, in Berlin, a demonstration of Fridays for Future with 20,000 young people protesting in Germany that um, the plans of our coalition uh, negotiations which are going on are, are not strong enough in order to stick to the 15 great, I mean, the 1.5 uh, degree warming uh, until uh, 2050. So this is a snowball effect, you know, started by one little Norwegian girl, you know. And, um, and the last one is uh, evaluation. Are the measures necessary? And this is uh, very important uh, to remain relevant. And at, at Transparency International, we simply have to do that all the time. And we have a democratic 
a, a cooperative a program of uh, more than 110 chapters all over the world, and they will then contribute if they are unhappy, uh, if you are uh, uh, becoming irrelevant. So, I mean, these are the recommendations made in this report, and uh, and I give you the uh, the um, way to 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 ask for the report. Uh, I think it's still on the internet. I personally feel it's very important to um, go into uh, to have to have a local approach. Uh, so what Transparency International uh, is doing with this national chapters is extremely important because a business person uh, in, uh, on the market in, in Ghana has uh, has different ideas than, than a, in a in a barber shop in in London and so on. So one has to really uh, find out what interests business people and to explain to them that good governance is in their interest as much in, as the interest of the government, hopefully, and as it is in the interest of uh, of the uh, of the uh, civil society so these are this is the first step and the second step then is to see whether uh, what well, can develop a a consensus and for that you need deliberation you need uh, open and respectful discussion and and uh, learn about the interests and the perspectives of the others and uh, try to find solutions for that and our uh, transparency is this uh, uh, ti bribery pact uh, is is a very interesting Example, because only when we started to uh, to propose the, the bribery pact, the big companies in Germany started to support us because we told them uh, you are not going to lose out if you stop bribing because we make sure that your competitors in given uh, competitive situations don't bribe either. So this is um, and then and then together to develop with the participation of these three actors, develop solutions. And then this this is a way to invite um, the the private sector to become our partners, the partners of civil society and government in creating better governance. And this is I can give you quite a number of examples, also negative examples. I mean, I when when Jill Dell was uh, talking about the um, the UN uh, UNCAC, the the German government. The, the parliament in Germany refused to ratify this for about five years. Why? Because under German law, uh, corruption of uh, deputies was allowed. So they thought it was too hard to distinguish um, uh, corruption from uh, from bribery, you know, if they're getting support from their constituencies and so on. So they refused to ratify this. About 130 countries in the world had ratified this convention, which um, which was passed in in Merida. Um, uh, in fact, we were there. We helped to to get it on the books, uh, and uh, and the German Parliament, uh, the parliamentarians refused to ratify this. I, I was so ashamed, you know. But uh, fortunately, they did it eventually when they were uh, when they when they learned how much uh, damage this was doing to their image, but also to their impact and so on in the world. So it is a it is an art um, to get our colleagues in in the private sector excited about helping us. And whenever we fight corruption, of course, we we are also supporting sustainable development and we are also uh, supporting the um, respect for human rights because they are so intertwined that it's hard to, to keep them separate. That was my, my brief uh, additional contribution. Thank you. Thanks, Peter, uh, Francois, Gillian, for everything. I think we, are, uh, we don't have any questions coming from, from the audience. And uh, I had uh, uh, one last question was uh, to ask you, uh, you that are working for so many years on, on, on anti-corruption, uh, how do you keep your hopes high? But I think we all have the question for now, how cannot, how cannot continue to advance human rights, sustainable development and, and love everywhere that we think we need. We need it also from, from companies because companies are made of people. Uh, companies don't exist without the people and, and I think that we will have a lot of colleagues and friends uh, within the business sector uh, motivated as we are to, to advance anti-corruption uh, all over the world. I thank you all so much for being here uh, on my name and, and from Rose and to our behalf. And we hope to continue uh, this path 
uh, towards this transformative agenda. And thank you so much to, to Maria João Lois for, for your, your help and, and support from the A Grants Fund. And, and hopefully next year, we will be able to meet uh, in presence uh, in, the, in the final conference uh, of this event. Thank you so much. And we'll see you in a few days. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.